Okay, we are rolling. So um, I want to introduce Anna Kraft and Tim Bucknell, who are going to be talking us today, talking to us today about transformative deals. Um, so it is going to be fun and exciting. And if you have questions um, or comments, please feel free to put those in the chat. Anna and Tim, I will keep an eye on the chat so that you don't have to. Um, and <clears throat> in case you just joined us, let me paste in the uh, go link to this presentation uh, that Anna kindly shared a few moments ago. And with that, I will turn it over to Anna and Tim and let them get started. Thank you, Jenny. Um, thanks everybody for being here. So um, I am going to share my screen. And um, oh no, host disabled participant sh screen sharing. Sorry, I didn't use the host login, Jenny. Um, Let's see if it will I'm work. I'm fixing it, hold on. Thank you. Okay, sorry, this is taking Fine. a second. I'm just gonna go ahead and also make you co-host in case that is helpful. All right. So this should be loading. All right, do y'all see some slides? Yes. Great. Okay, so I am. I think I'm gonna stop my video while I am talking, but I'll probably turn it back on for questions because um, sometimes there I have some a, a lag with my video. Um, okay, so transformative deals. Where do they come from? What do they do? Tim and I are glad to be here to talk to y'all about this today. And the go link to the slides is here. And here's what we're going to be talking about. I know many of y'all are very familiar with open access publishing and know a lot about that, but we're going to have a quick refresher about that and why it relates to these republished deals. We'll talk about what the transformative or republished deals are, and what that means for all of us, and how those can help fund open access publishing on campus, including for library people. Uh, we'll mention the open access publishing fund and how that fits in. And we would be delighted to answer any questions that y'all have. So if you only remember one thing um, from this session, there's gonna be a lot of information, but if you or your faculty or students or others on campus have questions about funding open access publishing, please get in touch with me. We have a lot of options. Sometimes things change. If you wanna make sure that you have the latest information, I would be glad to talk to you more about this and to talk to faculty, students, and staff on campus about it. So a quick refresher on OA. This is the problem that open access is trying to solve. So we have universities and funders such as the government and others who are paying faculty and researchers to conduct research. And faculty and other researchers are generally expected or potentially required to report out on what they learned especially if tax dollars are involved or especially if they want to get tenure. So they're doing things like writing articles and getting them published. And the academic publishing model is kind of bonkers. It, uh, these publishers get these inputs, our articles, for free. And faculty are giving away those articles and their copyright to publishers. Um, and then other researchers out there are providing peer review services for free. Uh, there is, you know, stuff that publishers do that provides value and adds to this process, but this is a, a strange business model that does not, um, I don't know if something like this appears elsewhere in uh, other systems. So publishers make a lot of money. I have not fact checked this infographic, but it says that Elsevier's profit margin exceeded Google's. Uh, I would believe it. I have not fact checked it. So I am not totally sure uh, that that is true. But Elsevier makes a lot of money. Publishers make a lot of money on these inputs, these articles that they get from faculty and researchers. And then libraries and other institutions have to buy back 
the research results, these articles that their faculty produced. Um, and these things can cost a lot of money. We know that libraries spend a lot on subscriptions and this perpetuates a problem where people can't get access to the articles and other research that they need. So this is all going into a closed system where you have to pay to get those research articles and there are libraries and individuals and other institutions who can't afford some of the research and information that they need. So open access is trying to address this problem by making these research outputs available online without charge and without things, other barriers like sign-ins um, where you would have to sign in to access the content. So this is important because it accelerates discovery, it makes things available quicker to everyone, it enriches the public by making things available to everyone, and it supports improving education by making this information available to anyone. And there are lots of different types of open access. Um, it's sometimes categorized based on color um, or based on who is making the content available or it's how that availability is funded. The most common terms are green and gold. Uh, green is when the author is making the content available openly. Gold is when the journal is making it available openly and the whole journal is open access. But there are an increasing number of other terms, some that I've learned about just recently. Um, bronze, diamond, platinum, black open access. And really what you need to know is that in all of these models, the content is free for the readers to access. So no matter what kind of open access it is, the readers should be able to get access to it. It really is just a question of who is making it available and how. So aside from making information and research results available to everyone, what can open access do for me? So if you are a person who is publishing your scholarship, um, there is a large and increasing body of research that shows that articles that are made available through open access tend to have higher citation counts than those that are published through toll or subscription access. And this has been shown enough, uh, commonly enough in the literature and research that it has a name, and that's the open access citation advantage. And there can be some variance according to discipline uh, that affects what kind of advantage this is. Um, these are some recent studies, they're all linked in the uh, notes on the slide, and you see there's a pretty big uh, variety here, 8%, 19%, 40%, and there are a whole lot of other studies that show a varying, uh, a variety of percentages. So we don't know exactly what the value is in terms of the exact number of citations that you might be able to expect. And it's really gonna vary based on different things. The important thing is that there is an advantage. So if you're publishing openly, you can expect to get more citations, more views, more people reading your work than if it was published behind a paywall or subscription. So with all that said, does anyone, and some of y'all have seen a very similar presentation to this already, what is the primary difference between open access scholarship and traditional scholarship? So I know some of y'all know the answer to this. Does anyone want to throw out an idea in the chat or speak up? So, Here's the primary difference. Has anyone seen one of these before? I expect that probably all of y'all have seen one. Yes, this is a paywall. So I was trying to access an article, but we don't subscribe to this journal and Taylor and Francis will kindly allow me to buy this article for $51 or purchase the whole issue for about $200. And that's a lot of money. Um, and maybe 
I have $51 that I could spend on this article, but maybe I don't. And maybe I'm not totally sure that this is the article that I need. So maybe it looks good based on the title and the abstract, but I really need to read it before I determine if it's gonna be useful to my research. And paying $51 for something that turns out not to be worth it, that seems like a big drag. And what if I also need 10 or 50 or 100 other articles and we also don't subscribe to those? This could get really expensive really quickly. And a lot of researchers are not able to afford that. Um, so the primary difference between open access and traditional scholarship is that the bills are not paid by the readers. So those bills, uh, they're not functioning as access barriers. So otherwise, things are very much the same in terms of there can be peer review with open access, there can be all the other types of value and things that you would expect with traditional publishing can be found in the open access world too. Um, it's just that you are not as a reader having to pay to access the content. So while it's free for readers to access, it is not free to produce or publish. So there are of course still costs associated with all of this. So there are costs associated with the time of the people who are working on these journals, the staff that the journal may have, there, is, there are costs associated with the online systems that the journals have in place for managing, accepting manuscript submissions and then publishing things online. And then of course, journals wanna make money too. Um, so there are definitely costs associated with publishing, no matter what model you are looking at. And in some open access publishing, the costs are funded through what's called article processing charges or APCs. And these are payments coming from the author or someone on the author's side of the equation of a processing fee to the publisher. So this does not mean it is, I'm gonna pay you and you're gonna publish whatever I want. That's bad. We wanna avoid that at all costs. Um, this is a payment that should be going to a legitimate journal that is then providing value to you, such as peer review, layout, all of these other things. Um, and not just publishing anything that they get. So, and you should only be paying an APC for an article that is accepted, not for just to get your article read and then potentially rejected. And this APC model is common in what's called hybrid and fully or gold open access journals. So hybrid journals are when some of the content is closed or subscription based and some of the content is available openly and that is usually funded by APCs. Gold open access journals are when all of the content is available openly, and that's generally funded by APCs. Sometimes these APCs can be paid by the author's funding agency or their employer, but definitely not always. So these generate the income to cover publishing costs that might otherwise be covered by subscriptions, advertising, or other things. They can sometimes be funded through financial awards or credits, and we'll be talking more about those in a minute. In rare situations, they may be waived in cases of hardship or geographic location, and I would not recommend that somebody in this country um, try to get a waiver based on geographic location. When we're talking about waivers for geographic location, we're thinking more about the developing world and places that really do not have funding or uh, to support things like this. Um, but there may be cases where researchers are in a hardship situation and it, it really can't hurt you as a researcher to reach out to the journal and ask about potential waivers. Um, it is possible in some cases to get one or to get a, a break on how much you're having to pay. APCs can really vary across publishers. There are some OA publishers that don't charge them. And this model, I only just recently learned about this terminology and I've heard it in a couple of presentations recently. Um, there are journals that don't charge APCs but are open and are uh, not charging APCs through kind of benevolence or being funded through an institution that believes in supporting open access. 
that model is called in some some places it's called platinum OA and some places it's called diamond OA. And I guess that we here at UNCG with our open journals could technically call them diamond or platinum OA because no one is paying APCs to publish in those. UNCG is funding um, through our work the, the system that is available for people and individual journals are funding the production through their staff. Um, but anyway, APCs can be relatively cheap as little as a couple hundred dollars, which is still a lot of money. Um, that's pretty uncommon. There are also some APCs that can be very expensive. When I was initially working on these slides, the highest one I had seen was about six grand, but there is a new initiative from Springer Nature that has an APC cost of $11,390. Just started January 1st. It is so much money. Um, it is unclear how that is going to shake out, but that is oops, really uh, pretty bonkers. So luckily, most of them are not that high. Um, the average reflected in the literature and in terms of what I have seen is around maybe $2,100 to $2,700. $3,000 is a pretty common amount. Um, sadly, prices for APCs appear to be rising faster than inflation. So this can be quite expensive. And publishers and journals should be completely transparent with you about what you are expected to pay. So you wanna look for that information before you submit your manuscript. If you send your manuscript first, you may be uh, unintentionally agreeing to something without knowing all of, <clears throat> of what's involved, especially if it's a journal that does not operate ethically. So you wanna be submitting your work to journals that operate ethically and looking for this information first. If the information is not clear, uh, reach out to them. And if they won't share that information with you or you feel like you are not getting clear information, you may not wanna send them your work. That's a, a pretty big red flag. And if you're not sure about a journal's practices and if they are operating ethically, librarians can help evaluate journal quality. Liaison librarians can help with that. I can help with that. So it's always good to check out your journal before you send them your work. So say I'm a researcher, I want to publish openly, but I'm worried about finding funding. So what can I do? The libraries are here to help. And uh, Tim is gonna take over for this next section. Um, so Tim, please take it away and I will advance the slides as requested. All right, next slide, please. So uh, libraries historically have participated in read deals, whether we're subscribing to a single print journal or whether we're subscribing to all of Elsevier's e-journals, we are subscribing to them in order for our faculty and students to be able to read them. Uh, we're not paying uh, these publishers for the rights to publish within those uh, titles that are behind paywalls. Now there's a more recent development uh, called read and publish or transformative that kind of mixes the two, uh, read and publish. So I, I prefer the term read and publish to transformative because these deals do obviously have a read component. We are paying to be able to read uh, the articles that are published in the journals and they have a clear publishing component as well. Our faculty have a mechanism to publish OA within those titles. Uh, some librarians and libraries call them transformative deals. Uh, the UC system is the biggest proponent of that. Uh, I don't know if they're transformative or not. Time will tell. Um, it would be nice if they were. Uh, I suspect that they may not be. There's some issues of fairness and balance with the transformative deals, just as there are with uh, the traditional big deals. Next slide, please. So in the current model, we are paying uh, publishers to read all of the content and 100% of the funding that goes to Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, or whatever from the library is going to a the ability to subscribe and read and under these new deals 
uh, a part of the money that we pay to these publishers goes to open access publishing. It doesn't necessarily mean we pay them less. And indeed, if you are going from a read deal to a read and the publish, you're getting more, right? The ability to subscribe to all the journals and read them and get publishing in them is better than a read only deal. So it actually makes sense. It would cost more. So it's not necessarily getting more for less or more for the same. Uh, it is something that is more <laughs> and may cost more as well. Uh, and they obviously have more benefit because the more articles that UNCG faculty publish that are with these prestigious paywall journals for which their articles are freely available OA, even though they're in a paywall journal because of this special deal we have so that their articles get to be made freely available. The more articles we have like that, the higher the citation counts and the more scholars around the world uh, can encounter and use the research of our faculty. So there's a clear benefit to us. Next slide, please. So why do we want to pursue these deals? Well, there's, there's several reasons. Obviously we want to share our faculty scholarship and we want uh, that higher citation count. Uh, also, you know, we want a better deal with more than we have now. We don't want to just subscribe. We want to be involved on the publication side as well. Uh, there's also an element of anger in a lot of the support for the read and publish deals, um, some people, and it's particularly, I think, deans and some deans and administrators who are just fed up with the current big deals that they have, and they just want to try something different, anything different, whatever it is, anything's got to be better than what we have is kind of the philosophy of a lot of folks. So uh, there is interest in pursuing these deals uh, and seeing how they work. Uh, publishers want to pursue these deals partly because li some libraries do and are being very vocal and pushing uh, for them. And publishers do want to keep libraries happy. Uh, and they do want to keep these big deals extant um, because they do produce pretty significant revenue streams. And make no mistake about it, a read and publish is just a bigger big deal. I mean, it's, it's kind of ironic because a lot of the people who want the read and publish see it as an alternative to the big deal. It's not really, it's the same. You get all the same read access you get with the big deal. Plus you get something else. It's an even bigger deal. And it often has an even bigger cost. Uh, the publishers do feel the pressure and they are making some accommodation uh, for these types of read and publish. Next slide. But even though we are seeing more and more of these read and publish deals, it doesn't really force any specific choice on any of our faculty authors. Uh, our authors have the ability to publish in commercial publishers or nonprofit publishers. Uh, they can publish open access, they can publish behind a paywall. And if, if uh, we have a read and publish deal with a particular publisher, uh, the faculty member as the author of making their specific article open access or not. It's up to them. This doesn't change control of the article. It still resides squarely with the researcher and author. So in a, just a bit, Anna's going to go through deals that we have with some publishers. And the obvious question is, why do we have read and publish deals with Cambridge and IGI, but not with Elsevier or the American Chemical Society? Why, why some deals and not others? And, and how are these set up? And how do we choose which ones we want to work with? So to some extent, some publishers are fairly aggressively uh, pushing a read and publish model, and they feel like it is going to work for them. And some have approached us with a read and publish offer. Uh, for others, we are approaching them um, many of those new read and publish deals are coming through uh, the consortium, Carolina consortium, uh, approaching publishers and asking them for a read and publish opportunity. And there are some UNCG specific deals as well. Next slide. Is it worth it? So I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's very early. Uh, our first read and publish deals were initiated in January 2020. And the Carolina Consortium uh, felt like 
it was something we should take a look at and we should offer a variety of deals and hopefully we would get enough uptake from the member libraries that we would have a good sample size and run you know a pilot essentially for a year and see if they worked and if they did if they worked for better for big schools or little schools uh, better for you know just kind of evaluate them and see how they worked uh, and we're only a year into that we haven't seen we, ha we had a fair number of schools join these read and publish deals that we offer but very few have taken advantage of the publish component of it which is kind of the point there's we're not doing read and publish deals to just to say we're in these deals we're joining them in order to take advantage of the ability to publish OA. And so far that really hasn't happened to any significant extent. Uh, but again, it's, it's early days and we think we have some deals afoot that will uh, perhaps accelerate our OA publishing. Next slide. And back to you. Right, thank you, Tim. So as Tim said, uh, now we're gonna talk about the actual deals that we offer that can help researchers. So these are the four deals, um, Cambridge University Press, SAGE, IGI Global, and MDPI. And we'll talk about each of them on the following slides. So Cambridge is the newest and it is the most exciting and potentially impactful. And this one, I mean, I, I struggle to not use the phrase big deal, but this is a big deal. This is, and not just in the library sense, like this, I, this is exciting. All Cambridge University Press articles published that have a corresponding author at UNCG, and the corresponding author, to be clear, is the person who is submitting the article. It's not just that there has to be a UNCG person somewhere in the list of authors. It means you're the one who is submitting into the system. Um, all of those articles are eligible for open access publishing with no APC. Um, this is the most potentially useful and directly impactful read publish deal that we've got. It just started January 1st, and we really want people to take advantage of it. So there are no APCs, there are no vouchers, there are no limits, and it's open to everyone at UNCG. Faculty, staff, students, everyone. If you have a UNCG email address, you can take advantage of this deal if you are publishing with Cambridge. And it's really ideal for researchers who want to publish their work openly, but don't have funding for APCs. And on this slide and the next one, there's a link to the list of Cambridge journals that you can consider if you'd like to look at what journals might be a good fit for you. There is a small list of non-OA journals, mostly ones that are not online, that are excluded from this deal. Uh, Cambridge is trying to move more of those journals toward being online and open as this year progresses. So that list should be shrinking. And if you really wanna make sure that your journal is not excluded, you can contact me and I will confirm that for you. So Cambridge has more than 380 peer reviewed academic journals that are in subjects across the humanities, social sciences, science, technology, medicine, a lot of areas. And the list to their journals is on this slide. So if you're interested in looking at them, definitely take a look. And how does this work? They have an online manuscript submission system that should recognize that submitting author's email address ending in uncg.edu. Um, and then it should give the person the option to select free OA publication of your work. And I mean, why would you not select that? The, this, hopefully people will, will know that they should take advantage of this and we're trying to get the word out to people about why this is um, what's happening here and why they should take advantage. Um, so hopefully people will see this and do it. I don't know of anyone having tried this yet. Um, it sounds like it's going to be easy, but I can't say for certain and I really hope that it is easy. Um, so I, if you or your faculty or students are publishing with Cambridge and you um, try this out, please let me know how it goes. This is not something that the author has to come to the library or talk to the library in order to get. So we wouldn't necessarily know initially 
whether or not people are doing this. This is, I imagine that we will get data from Cambridge as the deal progresses about how people are adopting this, but we won't, authors don't have to talk to us to get this deal. Um, so we won't uh, necessarily know when people are using it immediately. Okay, so our next publisher is Sage, and they offer a 10% discount on APCs for all UNCG authors that publish in the Sage Pure Gold OA journals. What are those? Um, this is their line of fully open online journals. So all of the content in these journals, like other gold OA journals, is fully open and is generally being funded through APCs. And the list of that journals is linked here. And they have, I think, between 150 and 200 fully OA journals. They're primarily a social sciences and behavioral science publisher, but they do have some coverage in other areas. And that list of journals, again, is linked on this slide. And here's what you do to get this discount. So after your article is accepted, you email this address after you are asked to arrange payment of the APC. And then you include all of the information on this slide. And you wanna uh, be clear that you're part of the Carolina Consortium 10% discount. So this is a deal that's coming through, as Tim mentioned, the Carolina Consortium. I don't know of anyone trying this yet. Um, and, but again, like the Cambridge deal, authors don't have to contact us in order to get the discount. Um, so, a lot of Sage's APCs are, are in the like $3,000 ballpark. So 10%, while it is something, it is not a lot. But there is a way to potentially lower this cost even more. And we will get to that in just a minute. The next publisher is IGI Global. And this one has, with them, we have a limited number of APC credits that are available for publishing OA articles and book chapters with IGI. And this is something where we, uh, we got a number of credits based on how much we spent with IGI. So we spent X number of dollars, we got X number of credits. So we could potentially buy more content from IGI in that read model and get more credits for publishing. Um, unlike the SAGE and Cambridge deals, which are open to everyone and anyone can take advantage of, we have a limited number of credits and they do expire. So if you or one of your researchers is publishing with IGI Global, get in touch. Um, we would love to use these credits before they expire. So definitely reach out. Um, these are the areas in which they publish. They do publish in library and information science and a number of other fields. And I know people in, uh, in here have published with them. And actually we have used one of these credits, Melody Rood published in a, a book chapter with them last year and used one of these credits. So that worked out great. Um, our next publisher is MDPI, and this is not truly a read publish deal. We are not paying them anything. Um, they are a fully open access publisher, but they are included here because the end result for um, authors is the same. They're getting a discount to publish with this publisher. So like Sage, we have a 10% discount on APCs for all UNCG authors that are publishing in MDPI journals and also a 10% discount for book processing charges if you're publishing a book with them. And you wanna ask for the discount at the time that you submit your manuscript to this publisher. These are the areas in which they publish. It looks somewhat similar to IGI. And again, this is not technically a read publish deal. And I do wanna note that they have journals, they do have some journals that are uh, respected and that are high quality and that I, I know researchers at UNCG have published with and used this discount with. They do have other journals that are newer and potentially have not fully developed their practices to be at the level that we might want them to be at. So as you would do with all journals, you wanna consider the journal carefully before you submit your work. So is one of these publishers or journals right for you? This is where I would highly encourage talking to the liaison in your subject area. 
I am a generalist and I can tell you about the deals and what we can offer, but I am not a subject expert. So I, I'm not in a good position to recommend specific journals, but the subject liaisons are in a great place to be able to say, if you need, to, if you want to publish with Cambridge, here are some journals that might work for you. So get in touch with them for uh, questions like that. And if you want a refresher about any of this, or if you want to see if anything has changed in the future with any of these deals, this LibGuide that we've got is the best place to go for reminders. And of course, you can also ask me. And we also have the Open Access Publishing Fund. We've had this for a number of years, and this offers awards of up to $1,000 to offset the cost of publishing in open access journals. And it's available to full-time faculty, full-time EHRA employees, and enrolled graduate students. And we have a limited amount of money in this every year. We've funded it for, I'm not sure how many years now, but quite a few. Um, but it's a library and I believe ORE that are paying into funding this um, fund. So there's an online application form and a LibGuide with information about applying. And there is still money for this academic year. It is possible that we will run out before the academic year ends. Um, so if this is something that you are considering, I would encourage you to get your application in as soon as you can. We do expect that we would have funding for the next academic year. I can't say for sure how much that would be, um, but this is, uh, as I said before, something that we have um, funded for a number of years and it's seen as important and it's used on campus. So we do hope to continue to support it. And if you need help with evaluating an open access journal um, and you're worried about the quality or the policies of it, you are welcome to get in touch with me. We also have slides and recorded presentations about um, choosing quality journals. So you can actually bring these deals together in some, uh, some situations. So potentially you can combine funding from the OA Publishing Fund with discounts that we get through these read publish deals. So this would be especially useful to you if you're publishing with SAGE or MDPI. So, so you're publishing with SAGE and you've got an APC of $3,000. You could apply to the OA Publishing Fund to cover $1,000 of that, and you could still apply to or get that 10% discount through SAGE of 10% off that full $3,000 amount. Um, SAGE doesn't need to know about the OA Publishing Fund, like that doesn't matter to them. They just need to know, um, you know, the full amount of your APC and then whatever that discount might be. Has anyone tried this? Not that I'm aware, but I would love for someone to test it out. And we would love for y'all to spread the word among your colleagues, faculty, graduate students, others who may be publishing. We want people to use these deals. As Tim said, this is not something we're doing just to say that we are doing something transformative and new. We want people to be sharing their scholarship openly and actually taking advantage of these deals that we are paying for. And we would love to hear about experiences from people who are trying them. We wanna know if things are working. We wanna know if things are not working. And this can potentially inform decisions that we might make in the future about continuing or changing these deals. Anna, can I ask a quick question right here? Yes, of course. Um, so someone uh, asked a question to me directly that I wanted to share and it uh, aligns quite well with this slide. Um, and that question was, can we share this presentation with our faculty members if we're liaisons? Yes. Yes, please do. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if there are departments that would like someone to come and talk to them about this, talk to their department meeting, talk to their graduate students, I am glad to do this. I would love to work with liaisons to um, go to departments together and talk about this stuff because liaisons are, y'all are the subject experts, um, but, and actually Megan and I talked to a class recently of graduate students who um, were, we talked about read publish and in that conversation, as we were talking about these deals, 
the faculty members, the, the teachers of the class were saying, yeah, I've used the IGI or the, um, the MDPI deal before. And oh, um, so-and-so student, like this Cambridge journal might be good for you and your work. So that was exciting. Um, I would love to make more connections like that. So moving forward, if you need help with anything related to this, who can help you? Liaison librarians with that subject expertise in potentially identifying journals and maybe evaluating those journals and finding the right publication or publications to send manuscripts to. So they are a great first place to go. I'm the main contact for questions about open access and OA publishing support. And I maintain the LibGuide that's uh, linked here in the presentation. Christine is the one that leads the team that reviews applications to the OA Publishing Fund. And she also manages the logistics of transferring that money to departments. And then Tim, of course, is leading the Carolina Consortium team and negotiating these deals with publishers. And that's what we've got for you. So, um, Thanks again, y'all, for being here. And if you have got questions, we would love to um, to answer them. Yeah, I have I have one more point to make here about um, publishing OA, uh, and that is that we do have NC Docs as well. And that you know, if one of our faculty gets an article accepted for publication in Nature. Um, which is a super prestigious journal and really helped them get tenure. So they want to do that for sure. And then they see that the APC is $11,000 and they don't want to do that. I sure wouldn't. They can put that article in NC Docs. Uh, now, the question is, why would you pay 11000 if you can put your article out for absolutely nothing if it's exactly the same? The thing is, it's not exactly the same. There's probably slightly more prestige to being on the journal's actual site. That's not really measurable. But I think it's kind of seen as, I don't know, more authentic somehow if it's actually on the journal site. And the version that is in NC Docs isn't necessarily the final, final version with every table with the same pagination if you wanted to cite it, et cetera. So the version that's on the publisher site that you might have to pay to publish probably has somewhat more value. Um, but is it $11,000? And not if it's my money. Is it, you know, $100? Uh, maybe if somebody else is paying for it. So, you know, there's, there's that to keep in mind too. Anybody's article that's accepted can always be published away uh, if you just send it to, to Anna and Tiffany. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up NC Docs as part of this. The, uh, when we really quickly went through the types of OA earlier, Green OA is when it's the author versus the publisher who is making the work available openly. And that's what NC Docs is. It is a green OA publishing or sharing, not publishing venue. And we can, like Tim said, we can generally add almost everything. There are some cases where, in terms of articles, um, there are some cases where we copyright restrictions prevent us from adding certain things or from adding certain versions. So it might be not the final, final version of the article that we can share. Um, but NC Docs is a great place for sharing scholarship uh, if you do not have uh, APC funding for your articles. And that uh, information about NC Docs and that aspect of OA sharing can definitely be incorporated into presentations for departments and other groups. So. Yes. Um, other questions or comments? Uh, I will just point out that um, Sam shared in the chat um, that Anna has done some shorter webinars related to this topic um, and that she has one coming up on quality journals um, to publish in if anyone is interested. Yeah. So. Uh, in the fall, I did a session about predatory journals and trying to avoid those. And we're often talking about, you know, the, the bad practices of journals, the things you want to stay away from. This next session is going to be about good practices and um, things that you might want to look at when you're identifying a good journal to publish in. 
And the last one you did right in Feb January, it's early, still early February, um, was uh, on open access funding. So it covered a lot of what Anna and um, Tim covered today, uh, but it was, it's shorter and it was like uh, really just geared towards faculty and grad students as well. So again, if, you, if you're trying to send stuff out to liaisons, um, to, if liaisons are trying to send stuff out, that's another option as well. Yeah, yeah, the, this slide deck was changed a little bit to be more library specific. Um, I mean, not all departments need to know like all of all of the details that are in here. The one that I did for Sam's uh, webinar series is a little, perhaps a little better in terms of a set of slides to send to departments. And I can get those that link to anyone who's interested. Uh, but of course, they're, wel they're welcome to look at these slides too. And if they have questions, they can just ask. Um, so a question for y'all, does, uh, ha have any of y'all published with these publishers? Cambridge, SAGE, IGI, MDPI? I have not, um, but I, I really want some people to publish with these, with these journals and take advantage of these deals. So, <laughs> um, yeah, if if um, if any of these uh, seem like they would be good fits for y'all's research, definitely pursue them. And if you talk to colleagues, faculty, students who are interested, please talk about this because we really want people to use these deals. Any other questions for Anna or Tim? So Tim, what if somebody comes to us and says, why don't you have a deal with my favorite publisher? Can we get a deal with this publisher that I like publishing with? Uh, yeah, send them to me and I'll, there would be a specific answer for each publisher. There's some publishers that just aren't willing to try this model yet they're letting others test the water and then you know they'll see how it goes and then maybe they'll get in and maybe they won't there are some that are doing uh deals with you know one or two schools as a pilot and no one else can participate you know for the one year period or two year period and then at the end they're going to consider opening it up some of the others were the pilot. There's some deals we're in that, you know, we're the only ones in the country that have an r &P with uh, this particular publisher and they're using us to assess whether or not it's working or not. Uh, so it's really very early days for all these publishers. They can see that many libraries are enthusiastic about a different model and the publishers have made a lot of money off the old model. So they want to experiment and see if they can continue to make money off the new model as well, which is, you know, again, kind of interesting because a lot of the reasons librarians are interested in the new models, they think it'll be cheaper. Um, but if it saves us a lot of money, it's not something that the publishers would be super excited about. I mean, if they just wanted to save us money, they could just stick with the old model and cut our costs by 50%. I mean, they don't have to move to a new model to do that. Um, so there's this kind of balancing act where we're asking for more than we have now, a better deal, the, the ability to subscribe to all these titles plus get published, but somehow we've got the expectation that when we ask for more, it should be given to us for less. And that's, I mean, we, we should ask, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm all about trying to negotiate that, but that's a tough ask. So it's, it's, there's a different answer for every publisher and, uh, if people are interested in a given publisher, just send them to me and it would be nice to know uh, where that interest lies because it, it might change uh, what kind of deals we try to negotiate with those publishers. And then what about, um, do you have an idea of how many libraries consortia across the country or around the world are in read published deals like this? So it's, it's a big thing in Europe. So in Europe, most of their big deals are semi-centrally funded. So uh, the national government in some cases will pay for the Springer deal for all the universities in the country. Um, and 
those Europe seems to see these as more transformative and trying to change, break the current publishing model and introduce a new paradigm. And they're willing to put their central funding into it. It's a little tougher in the US and it's especially tough for a group like the Carolina Consortium where we've got a really wide variety of libraries. Um, you know, in our big deals, we've got, you know, NC State, we've got University of South Carolina, we've got all Duke, we've got these R1s, we've also got University of Mount Olive, Catawba College, Chowan, Guilford Tech, um, and the needs for the small schools are so different than the ones from the big schools. And if you think about moving to a read and publish model, why the heck would Chowan or Catawba care about that? They don't publish. That's not what they do. They teach. They're teaching schools and their faculty are not you know, they don't get tenure based on publication. It's nice if they do, but that's not what they're about. So adding that publication element for that group isn't that critical. So the consortia that are most interested in these read and publish deals tend to be ones like the UC system where it's 10 very large ARLs and they're all publish. So the homogenous publish consortia are the ones that are mostly doing these. And the ones like the Carolina consortium tend to be doing these read and publish deals as a pilot and a test to see how they work for the group. And there's not a whole lot of consortia doing that at this point. I think last year when we initiated all of our deals or most of our deals, we were doing more than any other consortium in the country. Um, so it, it's, it, it's evolving. Like many things. Thank you for that context. So we had a question in the chat from Alyssa. How did we get this great deal with Cambridge? And she said, I know they tend to be more generous with their green OA policies with a lot of publishers. I didn't know that. That's good to know. So they, so, so we let them know that we are interested in uh, a read and publish model. And we've, we've told a lot of publishers we're interested in hearing what they have to offer but we're not being super aggressive about pushing people because we don't know that it will necessarily work. And, you know, you only have so much credit to kind of use with the publisher to push them. And right now we want to use all of our you know, credit to push down prices because that's really the most important thing to us during this, this budget crisis. So we had let them know we were interested and uh, they're a UK based publisher, obviously, uh, and there was a lot of pressure for read and publish from the national government over there. So they really started rolling out this read and publish on a fairly broad scale. And because they knew we were interested, they brought it to us. So we told them we were interested and then they contacted us and said, oh, we got a model and we want you to do it. So it wasn't like, you know, we have a, an option. Maybe you want it, maybe you don't. How do you want to tweak it? It was basically they had a full-fledged offer that they were rolling out to multiple consortia. So we weren't able to kind of tweak it very much because it was a, a one size fits all solution for many consortia. Uh, but we were among the first to get it. Uh, at the time that we accepted that offer for the Carolina Consortium, the only existing deal with them, RMP deal with them in the country was the UC system. So we were the second in the country to do it. So we were, were very early adopters. Awesome. Um, so while we still have just a minute, I want to say uh, we are really glad to welcome our new electronic resources librarian, Catherine Heilman, who is here with us today. Um, so yeah, I see some, uh, Jenny put up a, a, a little party icon or emoji. Uh, Catherine, hi. Hi. I got in. I have email now. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Oh, good. Yes, I saw that Catherine got email and signed up right after the start of the session. So right yeah, away, I just I sent her the, I, the link. Thank you. I was on campus at 1030 and then I got back and then I signed up and I'm glad I got in a little late, better late than ever. Yeah, we are so glad that you're here. I'm really looking forward to working with you. Likewise. Well, welcome. Thank you. Um, Catherine may be working on the IGI CC deal, which is a transformative or read and publish deal. So it's a good segue there. Cool. Nice. 
Well, I want to say thanks so much to Anna and Tim for presenting and thank you to all of you for participating and asking questions. Um, we do have uh, more ULVLC sessions coming up as always. Um, so if you uh, check, keep, keep an eye on your email, but you can also go to our LibGuide where you can view our calendar um, and see kind of what we have coming up. Um, we have an anti-racist reading group meeting next week. And then the week after that, we actually have a double deal. We have two different um, sessions that are happening on uh, February 22nd, two sessions, 22nd, and they both start with the word engaging in their title. So there's a lot of uh, synergy going on there. All right, friends, thank you so much for coming. Um, and again, thanks to Anna and Tim for presenting and we'll see all of you later. Bye. Thanks, Jenny. Bye everybody. Have a good day.